Thanks, Atri. Uh, very nice to be here. Thank you all for coming. So, so um, I'm here today to talk about what I mean, what I all sometimes will call algorithmic fairness. What if I want to annoy social scientists, I'll call computational philosophy. Um, but really, it's all about the use of and the challenges of dealing with automated decision making in society, right? And something that we I will say more about in a second is something that we see is pervading all of society right now. So it's a very topical thing. And of course, to understand these challenges of algorithmic fairness or decision making, it's helpful to sort of lay the groundwork, some background on what is it the thing we're talking about itself. So this is going to be like the you know the ten second introduction to machine learning that probably everyone you already know. But of course, all the machine learning starts with, or at least narrowly supervised learning, which I'll sort of restrict myself from most of the stuff, but not all of it. Starts with some data, right? So you collect training data of some kind. Usually, it's data labeled with the, the labels of a task that we want to learn. <coughs> And um, we use a learning algorithm to build a model, and the model will make predictions about the world. Right? So and that's all that there really is to it. Right? All the mystery about deep learning and this and that, and all it boils down to have data, we'll predict. Right? That's all we basically do. And you, know, you have different abstractions. You might have points in a, in, a, in a vector space. You might have points in a manifold. You might have vertices of a graph. All these things are abstracted out in, in these neat little boxes. And then you predict the task that you want to predict. Um, predictions are allegedly objective, they are allegedly free of human biases, they're efficient, and like all the cool kids in the Bay Area would say, we have just disrupted decision making. And so the story goes anyway. And of course the, the application of this paradigm goes well beyond whether you should buy this book from Amazon or watch this movie on Netflix or listen to this song on Spotify. It actually has taken over pretty much all aspects of our life in ways that you may not always have expected you will see. So for example, there are algorithms that are in use right now to decide whether someone should be admitted to college. Right? There are algorithms that are being used right now, and again, they've been used for a long time, but even more micro-targeted versions of these have been used to decide whether you should get a loan. These are just some of, some of the many companies, small and big, that are involved in doing this. There are algorithms that are now being used to decide whether you should get a job, whether you should be screened for interviews, what, what kind of for the screen you should get, what kind of job you might be suitable for. And again, these are just few of the companies. So disclaimer, I'm a consultant for one of these companies, hired you up there, so I mentioned that front. There are algorithms that are being proposed to be used, or maybe already used, we don't actually know, to decide whether you can get on a plane tomorrow or not. Right? In fact, the Customs and Border Protection put out this call for help from the research community to say, you know, can we uh, build tools that will predict whether someone will be a good immigrant or not. And the research community basically said, go to hell. So uh, basically, that's what happened. Um, there are, and, and, and most sort of uh, consequentially, and probably the one that draws the most attention, there are algorithms now deciding every aspect of whether you stay out of jail or not. Right? These are, again, some of the companies involved with uh, software to decide where police are sent, whether you get arrested, if you're arrested, whether you make bail, when you get convicted, what sentence you get, and once you get sentenced, whether you get released on parole or not. All aspects of this are being used right now. This is, again, not a hypothetical. And um, one of the challenges right, is that when you go from book predictions to parole predictions, something funny happens. Right? These tools that we're using, that we build as data scientists, start affecting people in many ways. And as we sort of zoom out, as we start seeing the ramifications of the tools that we build, we are realizing that, that this whole world we built up with this sort of simple model of data and models and predictions becomes a little more complicated. Or to put it another way, you know, data is people too. <laughs> Something that we try to remind our students of. 
Sorry? Yes. <laughs> I was hoping someone would get the reference, but yeah. <laughs> so decisions, as they say, have consequences. For example, and again, if you make a mistake on parole recommendations, people will stay in jail longer than they should, or people will stay in jail not as long as they should. And again, this is a sort of a well-known uh, study from a couple of years ago that was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize by folks at ProPublica, showing that software used to do recidivism, to do prediction of recidivism, the likelihood of reoffense, had certain kinds of racial bias in it. That it was dis indiscriminately sort of giving more penalties or more errors to, uh, to African-American inmates versus white inmates. Uh, you, suppose you make a mistake on, you, you build software for recommending ad keywords to uh, advertisers, and you get to, as a special bonus, illegally exclude minorities from housing. So again, this is a story from Facebook. I used to joke that I could do a whole lecture on the ethical ramifications of Uber. I think I could do one whole thing on Facebook at this point. So, but, but at least this particular story, again, by folks in ProPublica, showed that Facebook's ad system was allowing advertisers to block certain ethnic minorities from seeing ads. And this is illegal. In fact, the Fair Housing Act, which made this illegal, turned 50 years old just this April. So this is not allowed, and it was being allowed but essentially by Facebook's automated, automated ad system. And you might say, well, you know, all of these problems happen because I just don't have enough data. The more data I have, the more truth I have. And then your Google News being faked out by 4chan. Basically building that, that attacks your Google News system to let fake news sort of percolate to the top of the news cycle. And the, when we look at all of these examples, when you look at all these cases, and there are many of them, every week I can change these slides over sort of new examples of something that's happened, it, it really boils down to one sort of fundamental issue that computer scientists or data scientists, the people who build these systems, have not really been ever trained to look at the larger context of the tools that we build. And this is not, you know, in some sense, well, in some sense it's a failing of our educational system, but also not because that the, the, the reason we've had success with data, with, with machine learning, is because precisely because we've been able to shut out and avoid context and be abstract and build these tools that apply across different domains. But the problem is now when they do apply in these sort of domains of huge societal significance, you get problems. And so I was going to talk to you about sort of the, the story of algorithmic fairness, about the research that's happened in this area in the last few years, and my sort of small role in that, in that work. But rather than just giving you a chronological story, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking that there's really a deeper story to be told here, one about how as we increase the level of context we bring into our thinking when we design tools for doing decision making, we discover new and more interesting technical problems that we now have to solve. And in some sense, in retrospect at least, the story of the work I'll be telling you about is the story of expanding circles of context and how that brings up different questions that we do need to solve. And, and I'm not saying by any means that these questions have been solved, but that we're trying to sort of operate in this question at different levels. So, you know, we might start off at just thinking about data mining world, as we'll see, there's expanding circles that go out. And the further we go out, we eventually actually hit sort of large, very deep questions about um, the ethical ramifications of what we do and how it affects society. So that's sort of the big sort of picture of how I want to talk about the work that I'm going to be describing here today. Uh, and I want you to keep the sort of notions of expanding circles of context in your mind as you talk. And again, um, just want to say, feel free to interrupt, ask questions. I'm happy to sort of take any comments in or before or afterwards. So let's expand context and talk about fairness, right? So again, we have this machine learning algorithm. We have inputs and we have outputs. And if we stop here, we're measuring things like accuracy and you know generalizability, and we're happy with that. But if we move out one more layer, we can ask ourselves, well, what are we doing with these answers we built? What are we doing with the decisions we made with this tool? And that brings us to the question of fairness, right? It's a question, it's a meta question about the results we, we know itself. And to sort of talk about fairness, I'll sort of use a very simple toy problem. Um, it's, a, it's a problem of binary classification. And again, if you don't know any machine learning, don't worry. In a binary classification problem, you have some input, and you want to classify it as a yay or a nay, very simple. Like the most simple form of supervised learning. This captures at a very basic level things like hire. Should I should I not hire someone? Should I admit someone? Should I not? Should I give someone a loan? Should I not? Right? Of course, these things are more nuanced, but this is a good vehicle to understand some of the issues. If I want to ask a question about whether my decision making process, in this case, the yay or nay decision, is fair, I have to define what it means to be fair. 
And again, there are many, many intuitive notions of what fitness means. And I'm not going to claim that the ones that I put forward now are the definitions. But I have to be, I have to start somewhere, and I have to introduce some precision into this. Otherwise, we'll, we will be talking at, at the wrong level of abstraction. So what are the different definitions of fairness that uh, we are beginning to sort of see evolve into place now? And these are all very old definitions. In some sense, you can go back to Aristotle, go back to basic notions of ethics, justice, to think about these definitions. Or, and so I'm not claiming these are new, but they're kind of a manifestation in modern language of things that have been around for a long time. So here's one of the, so the definitions of fairness that's been sort of, of, of in the news, or at least been talked about in the social media of late. This is by a paper by Cynthia Dwork and co-authors from five, six years ago. We'll call it individual fairness, and here's what it means. So here's a problem, and here's the solution. The problem is, I treat you differently for reasons unrelated to your skills for a task. This is a bad thing. <coughs> Don't do it. Individuals with similar abilities should be treated the same. So think of this as a guiding principle. In the next slide, I'm going to show you how to formalize this. But this is a no, and this is called individual fairness because you're defining this at the level of an individual. Right? Two individuals uh, who are similar for a task must be treated similarly. If they're similar, they should be either both rejected or both accepted or both rejected with the same probability or both accepted the same probability and so on. Now, while this notion is very natural, it's sort of a procedural notion of fairness and has a lot of intuitive power, it has the problem of missing out on certain other aspects of discrimination and bias namely this idea of what we call group fairness. Group fairness captures the sense of ideas of structural bias against groups, maybe based on demographics, based on gender, based on political opinion, based on religion, what have you. There's some structural discrimination against groups, and again, we shouldn't do that. In other words, groups should all be treated similarly. Now, as you'll see, you might start wondering, like, no, no I don't know if I agree with that. Those feelings are good, you must keep them. Because then we will argue about these things. But I just want to point out some of the definitions that people have come up with. And once I have such a definition, so the thing I like to joke about is that, you know, algorithms speak the language in math. So if you want to translate philosophy, we would translate into language that an algorithm will understand. So how do we mathematize these definitions? Well, here's one way you could do it. It's not the only way, but this is one way you can do it. So I want to formalize individual fairness. Remember I said individual fairness was people who are similar should be treated similarly. All right. If I define some distance function between people, which captures a similarity. If that is small, then the treatment in their classification world, once they're classified, should also be small. Okay, this is a perfectly reasonable definition. It's kind of like a Lipschitz-like condition on this function. Okay, and that defines initial fairness. I might say, well, for group fairness, I need to introduce some additional terms. That's okay. There's some kind of group label that says whether you're in the in group or the out group, or whichever group you happen to be in. I want the good outcome, so this is a one, it's like, yes, something good happened. I want a good outcome, or the probability of a good outcome, conditioned on being in the group, to be the same for both groups. And again, I can define same in different ways. I can say the difference between the two values should be small, or the ratio should be almost one. You pick your favorite one. But the point is there's some group-based notion of similarity. Okay, that's another definition. What we've begun to see now is another form of, of um, of measurement of fairness that doesn't talk about equity in group treatment, but equity in accuracy of group treatment. In other words, rather than saying that I want groups to be treated similarly, what I'm saying is that the errors across groups should be similar. So one, uh, one bad way of putting this would be to say, if I'm going to be willing to hire incompetent men for a job, I should be willing to hire incompetent women for the job as well. And that way, at least on a gender basis, I'm not discriminating on the basis of errors. And this difference between group treatment and group error treatment is at the, at the heart of a lot of controversy over this issue I mentioned earlier, ProPublica, and the case of recidivism predicting tools being racist or whatever. Yeah, uh, sorry. And of course, you know, there's nothing stopping you from generalizing this further. This is, after all, some function of that two by two confusion matrix between the ground truth and the predicted values. So you can imagine some more complicated expression between the ground truth and the predicted values that should be the same across groups. And in fact, at this year's uh, Fat Star Conference, there was a tutorial on the 21 fairness definition of politics. So there's quite a number of different definitions you can come up with to capture fairness once you start mathematizing. And this is not surprising to those of us who try to model these sort of more elusive notions of mathematics. All right. So now that I have my favorite one of the 21 definitions of fairness, yes. So are we to interpret these 21 definitions as we need to do more work to come up with the best one, or we should just live with 21 because 
can be useful in 2022? There's no such thing as the best one. Okay. And as for the second thing, I will get to it in a second. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, searching for the single best answer is a, is a, is generally been a recipe for disaster in this area. There cannot be one definition of privacy. If you're familiar with uh, work and privacy, a lot of that echoes what we're seeing now. Just like with privacy, there's so many different ways of thinking about it, reflecting different ways in which that one word captures our own intuition. The same thing happens here. So that's why I'm saying there's no single notion. That these notions capture genuinely different concepts of fairness that we have, and we should recognize the difference and not try to merge them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So now we have a preferred or a set of preferred definitions of fairness, and we're you know happy about that. What do we do next? Well, we want to make a little bit of decision making fair. And uh, this chart is helpful because it sort of gives you a sense of how people have tried to approach this question. So there's, been a, there's now a long literature on this topic, which I will not be able to do justice to in this talk. Uh, but roughly speaking, you can categorize methods into one of three groups. And, or, la or rather, let's say these are the eigenvectors of the methods. <laughs> there are some linear combinations of these things as well. Right? So the eigenvectors are modify the input. In other words, if your input to the training procedure carries some bias in it, modify the input so that no matter what training procedure you use, there is no way it can be biased. We'll have to explain what that means, but the attraction of this mode is to say, look, I don't have full control over how my training is working. All I have control is the data, so let me tamper with that. And uh, okay. so that's one way of thinking about this. Another way to think about it is no, 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 no. I do have control of the algorithm. I am the algorithm designer. Let me throw in some constraints into my algorithm design process to make sure that it's more fair. Maybe throw in fairness as a regularizer or something like that and optimize it. Another way to think about this is no, 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 no. I don't want to tamper my data and my algorithm. I spent like months training my deep learning system. I really don't want to change it right now. But what I can do is tamper with the outputs. Right? So change the results what I'm getting if I don't like the fairness criteria it's giving. And there are lots of, we were talking about legal issues, there are lots of illegal issues with where you do these interventions, what might be used as legal. I'm not talking about that right now, but there's a subtle point here where, according to the Supreme Court, tampering with something here might be bad, but here they don't know, and things like that. There's a lot of weird issues there. And so I'm going to talk about, just as an example, illustrate the kinds of thinking that goes into this. Only one of these things. I, there's no way I can do justice to the entire area. And so since I'm the one standing up here, I'll tell you about one of our papers that sort of did this. So we're going to focus on how to modify the input. Okay. So let's try to understand some of the issues involved with what does it mean to modify the input to a training process to remove bias? What are we talking about? So let's think about different kinds of bias you might have. So let's say you have a data set. You have some attributes, x and y. x is the protected attribute, so the attribute that you do not want to discriminate on ethnicity, gender, what have you. It's given to you ahead of time. Someone's told you this is something you should be discriminating on. And why are the remaining attributes? You know, other information that might be useful for your prediction task. And the goal is to determine some outcome C. Right? So let's say it's admission or job performance or whatever. So direct discrimination would be when C directly relates to your predicted attribute. Right? So the sort of there. It's not hard to come up with examples. This is a picture from the uh, Library of Congress. You know, a sign a restaurant saying this is an example of direct discrimination. Right? You're directly discriminating, well maybe the dogs don't mind. Like no. <laughs> There is really no way to make a joke about this. It's just terrible. So, um, indirect discrimination on the other is a bit more subtle. It's an example where your outcome is a function of what look like innocent attributes, but that happen to correlate with the predicted attribute. Right? And this is also a form of discrimination that's prohibited, at least in certain settings, due to the Supreme Court cases from the past, you know, in about 40 odd years. Okay. And again, the best example of this is the example of redlining. So again, for those of you who are not familiar, back, so this is a map from uh, Chicago in the 30s. So the story goes that banks were trying to avoid giving loans to, to African Americans who were applying for loans. And even then, they weren't explicitly able to do direct, they weren't allowed to do direct discrimination. This would be considered illegal. So literally, they would go around with maps and draw red lines around certain zip codes, saying, okay, in the zip code, we'll, we'll, we won't give loans to anyone who listens to the code. The zip code being your unprotected feature was something that was sort of considered OK to do. But of course, the zip code was highly correlated with your protected feature because areas were segregated. And that's where the term redlining comes from. And that was what was declared eventually illegal. Okay. 
So this is an example of indirect discrimination. This is, of course, the harder form. If your, if, if your code was explicitly using a predicted attribute to make a decision, you might even be able to see it in your code. But if you remove that information from your code all because I'm not, I'm not using it because there's no way I can discriminate, then you're still potentially susceptible to this form of discrimination. And the question is, what do you do about it? So one idea we had was to frame this as an information flow problem. To say, look, the problem here is the following. You have some data set. It has some predicted attribute. You've removed it from the problem. And now you want to know if there's still information, latent information in the data that allows you to discriminate based on X, even though it wasn't there. Another way of saying this is that, is there enough information to predict X from the remaining data? For those of you who know information theory or fathers inequality, this is basically a restatement of that kind of field. Right? That, that prediction or the ability to predict is equivalent <coughs> to mutual information. That if you have one, you have the other. And so in some sense, if you say that you cannot predict, there is no way to reconstruct x from y because you've modified the data in some form, then you've lost that kind of shared information with x and y, and you hope to not be able to be biased because there's nothing in your data set that your algorithm can look at to actually figure out what x was, and therefore disconnect. So this is kind of a sort of conservative approach, saying, look, I want to do something so that no matter what algorithm I design, it will not, it will not be discriminated okay. So a quick sort of sidebar, um, there's this notion of disparate impact. Remember I told you what, how to measure group discrimination? I said one may do this via ratio. So this rule called the Fortress rule, that epsilon equal to 0.2, is in fact a, a rule for adverse impact in hiring. It says that there's a potential for disparate, and not, not an actual illegal process, but a potential for error if this ratio is less than Fortress. It should be more. And again, the main point is this focus is on outcome and not on intent. It's not looking for evidence of, of bias. It's looking for an outcome as flagging a potential problem. So why is it important? This is legal doctrine. This is what's used in, in case law to determine adverse impact. And what it turns out we can show is that, that this idea of using predictability as a proxy for potential for bias can actually be formalized. And roughly speaking, if you can predict x and y with some probability epsilon, then there exists some classifier that can extract this information to have disparate impact with some function. And this actually works sort of both ways around. So if you could somehow destroy this connection, then no classifier would be able to do this. Because if it did, then it could actually do the prediction in the first place. Right? So what does this mean? This means now we have a tool that we can actually use to try and remove bias from data. We can say, let's do something to our data so it fails a predictability test. Because in that case, we can hope that anything trained on that data will, will not fail a disparate impact. So how would you modify your data? So there are various, again, ways to do this. Well, we proposed one method that works in certain settings. Um, I think there's still more work to be done to, to expand this to marginal settings. But let me give you an example of what you think. So imagine I have a data set that looks like this. Imagine that these are two groups, the red and the blue group. This is, a, say, a distribution of SAT scores. This is the distribution for the red group, that's the distribution of the blue group. It's not hard to see that if I told you what the score was, I give you some number, with some probability of error, you might tell me what the color is. Whether it's from the red or blue. So here, with the reasonable probability, it must be red. If it's from there, blue, and then the <coughs> okay. So intuitively, if I want to modify my data so I can't do this, I somehow have to merge these conditional distributions together. Right? And one dimension is easy to see. And it turns out that if you, now you can always do this. You can just throw away all your data and put fake data in. That's not a problem. We are in the era of fake news after all. What's, what's, what's wrong with the fake data? <laughs> but of course, we don't want to damage what might be useful for our data. So again, if you go back to the language of privacy, there's this whole utility privacy trade-off. And you can think of that as being something that shows up here. You have data which is potentially useful, but has some problematic aspects. You want to eliminate the problematic aspects as much as possible without destroying what's good about the data. In other words, I'd like to minimally change these distributions in order to achieve this blurring of the, of, the, of the two conditional problems. And so when I say minimal, I say distribution, you think earth mover distance, or you should anyway, if that's what you mean. So in other words, if you can somehow formulate a distance function in terms of the earth mover distance between distributions, okay, can, I, can I find a new distribution that has minimal earth mover distance to these two things? Um, it turns out, at least in one dimension, you can do this very nicely. It involves basically computing medians of inverse CDFs. I'm not gonna get into the details here, but it's kind of, you know, well, I think it's cute, but it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it works in this very special case. And again, we generalize this to other higher dimensional cases a little bit harder. And an example of what you get then when you do that is you can get charts that look like this. So in brief, this axis for each of each column is one data set. 
the x-axis is the amount of disparate impact. Remember, we want to be above 0 0.8. So above this number is good. The y-axis is the amount of utility, the amount of effectiveness of your classification, the accuracy, if you will. And the color here is the, the lighter the color, the more of this repairing we're doing to remove potential discrimination between groups. Okay? So the brighter, the more you've done. So if you look at this chart, for example, what this is showing is that as you move um, from darker to lighter, as you'd want, your disparate impact measure gets better. And what you want to see is how much your accuracy dips, because you might expect this to happen. And as you can see, you can do these things and say, oh, look, for these data sets, your accuracy doesn't change that much at all. You are able to achieve the disparate impact threshold you wanted to without affecting accuracy. And for other data sets, not so much. You get a little bit more work than data sets just crazy. It's always, always crazy. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but, but you can see the same effect. So these are the kinds of things you can do once you say, look, I want to repair my data set to sort of improve the behavior of reality. And this is just one example of all right. So it, the yeah. spread impact range is less than equal to one? Or? It's, yeah. It should be less. Well, it's a ratio of, it's an asymmetric ratio, minority to majority group. Oh, so if it's more than one, then you, you've <laughs> reverse discriminated in some cases. So you don't want to be more yeah. than one, but you want to be in this range here. Okay. okay. So uh, going back to our chart, like I said, there are many, many different papers now that look at how to modify inputs, algorithms, outputs, combinations thereof, different kinds of models. There's a whole plethora of things. Right? And there are different measures of fairness on top of them, 21 different measures I told you about. And so one challenge is then, okay, so what, how do we make sense of all this? is the question you were asking earlier, what should we do? And so one study that we've been doing, we just sort of put this out in the archive a few months ago, and we're hoping to actually get more contributions, is kind of an empirical benchmarking study of different approaches. So this is, so what is this chart here? What we decided to look at was, okay, there are these 21 different definitions of fairness. How well do they correlate with each other? across different data sets, different ways of initializing, different ways of achieving fairness. And so these are, again, two different data sets, two different algorithms, and, um, and different measures of fairness. And what you roughly see is sort of a fair degree of correlation, positive correlation in blue, negative correlation in red, uh, between different groups of measures. So roughly speaking, these are all the group fairness measures. These are these sort of accuracy-based measures that I mentioned. And so even though there are 21 of them, they seem to have a lot of similarities in how they behave. So this is some preliminary work we've done. We want to get more data sets to contribute to this. Yes. The rows and columns are the same. Well, yeah, it's a correlation between yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so you want to see things along the diagonal, right? So that's what we expect to see. So we, you know, we, we've got this out there available. We want to, we're going to solicit more contributions, more algorithms, more metrics, more data sets, all these three things, to sort of, sort of investigate to what extent you really care about different notions of fairness. Right now, it seems like there are two distinct groups, but this means more work to solve. Another thing you can do with this, you can actually look at how different methods behave. So this is an example, sort of an intersectionality study, where you want to see if you're going to discriminate, if you're going to based on race or versus gender and versus both, and you try to correct them, how this works. So again, each chart is one particular algorithm for doing one of these things. And again, you have these accuracy and disparate impact trade-offs. But what's interesting is that different algorithms behave in different ways in different kinds of data sets. And so again, this is one of those things where some kind of meta study that says under what conditions does what kind of intervention work for what kind of problems is something that we still don't know the answer to. So there's a whole bunch of sort of experimental work to be done there as well. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Another question that comes up when you think about the ramifications of decision making, we talked about this somewhat at lunch, right, is that who's looking at the other? There's actually some person, maybe, who's looking at the results of what you're doing. And this gets me to what I'm going to talk about sort of in terms of audits. So again, here, the, the question is not so much, is this process fair? But the question is, what the heck is this process doing? Why did it give this decision to? Right? And again, you, this may not be in the context of, say, a resolution prediction where the judge has to give an explanation. It might be something as innocuous as, um, a bunch of chemists are trying to predict the outcome of a reaction, and they build a, a deep learning system to predict the outcome. The outcome. deep learning system says, yes, this reaction will produce this compound. like, why? Or maybe, uh, you know, in a, in a, the system that's analyzing MRIs for signs, early signs of um, Alzheimer's disease in the brain, and it says, yes, yes, there's a region here, and the doctor says, how, what, where, what, how do you figure this out? So this idea of audits, really, is really about the following question. You're given some black box function. 
can think of this as a result of some learning process. Can you determine the influence different variables have on the outcome? Right. So how do you quantify it, how do you model it, and how do you handle different kinds of influence? And this is important even in a fairness setting, because if I'm saying I'm building a model that is, you know, is free of influence from race, well, what does that mean? Can I quantify that in some way? Or can I see what are the most important factors are in a decision? That's often something that people care about. What are the five most important factors that led to this decision? Can I do that for Again, there's a, again, a body of work on this. Um, I'll talk very briefly about some of the things that we've been doing, but there's, there's a large literature that, you know, in fact, in the modern era, you go back to sort of paper by Leo Bremen where he introduces random forests. He talks a little bit about this problem there as well. And the basic idea is very intuitive, right? So it's, it's a essentially kind of sensitivity analysis, right? And you could, you know, reconstruct the next slide within, you know, two minutes of thinking about it. How do you do it? Well, I have some function. I, I perturb some variable. Like I create some noisy version of that variable. Right, I'm just a control of perturbation. I, I plug in the value into the function, get a new value, and I look at the difference. Right? It's a standard sort of sensitivity analysis. The catch, of course, of this makes this tricky is that you don't. That's not me, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the catch, of course, is that you don't always know how these variables interact. In fact, half the problem with doing this kind of sensitivity analysis is that variables interact in strange ways. And it's very hard to tease out what is the true contribution of one variable versus what is coming as a boost from another variable that's correlated with it. And that's the main challenge we have to deal with. So one of the things that we were trying to do in our work was say, OK, again, can we model this some kind of information flow problem? With the basic premise being that if you want to measure the information content of a feature, you can estimate it by trying to predict it from the remaining features. And once you can, if you can no longer predict it from another feature, then you've essentially eliminated its influence. Right. Again, if you go back to thinking about the sensitivity analysis that we were doing, the reason we did this is because you want to say, if I tamper with this variable, what is the effect on the outcome? And that's what I want to do in this general case as well, where this problem of correlation comes into play. So in general, what I want to say is that given two variables, x and w, that are correlated, I want to find a w prime that's conditionally independent of x that is still as similar to its original value as possible. What this will do is then now, I can look at how the influence of W changes independent of X. So think of this like an information theoretic PCA in some sense. Right. So you want to basically subtract out the influence in a systematic way. Again, there are lots of details. Our work is, for the moment, mostly heuristic, in the sense that I don't have formal guarantees on how these things work. But some of the results you can get from this look like this. So I mentioned this deep learning example. This is not hypothetical. This is work that uh, my colleague was doing with her colleagues in Harvard College. And so they were trying to predict the presence or absence of a certain compound in a complex direction, there are 273 distinct features. And so what you can do with these kinds of plots is say, okay, this is the amount I'm going to destroy the effect of a feature, and this is the amount my accuracy drops off in my prediction. What I expect is that things more or less kind of go get worse as you destroy the influence of a feature. The ones that are most influential should have the most effect on the accuracy. So if I plot this curve, and I look at these things in the reverse sorted order, each color being one feature, you get a sense of which features are most influential. And then, of course, you're not done at that point. You go back to the chemist and say, look, we found these 10 features to be the most influential based on our analysis of the model. Does that make sense to you? Or did the, did the model pick up on some weird artifacts that you should, that you shouldn't have been picking up? And so then we have this conversation. In fact, it, as it turns out, there, there was not too much surprise in the things that the deep learning system did. So that comes from so this first level of context, right? Where you sort of look at immediately what you're doing with the decisions made by the procedure, whether you want to make sure they're fair, whether you want to understand the good. If you expand out another level, you get to what I'll call the problem of representation. And this comes from looking at this thing from the other direction. So so far we've said nothing about the data that's going to the model. We tried to modify it and do things that are trained, but otherwise we really haven't questioned the features and data coming into the model. But suppose we did question. Suppose we looked at where the data was coming from. Most data we get is not raw data. It's sort of processed in some form. It's optimized in certain ways. Certain features are kept, certain features are removed. Choices are being made before you start training the model. What happens if that training process itself, that, mod, that feature extraction process itself introduces some forms of bias? But what does it mean to have bias in the representation? So there were two very nice papers from last year that tried to explore this question. Um, this is one group from Microsoft Research, another group from uh, based at Princeton and University of Bath in England. 
They were looking at embeddings produced by Wurtevec. So for those of you who don't know, Wurtevec is this method to construct a geometric embedding of X, of words actually. Right? So you, Wurtevec takes each word in a, in a corpus and constructs a vector of it, basically through some neural network training where you read out the last layer of the network as your coordinates, as, as your features. And the idea being that once you have the geometric representation of words, good things will happen. You can actually do all kinds of learning on certain things. And so they started looking at Wurtevec, and they found very interesting things. If you looked at words that were stereotypically gender sort of uniform, like man and woman, very clearly it was one gender or another, and you looked at which words were embedded in proximity around these words, they observed things like this, where the word used to embed doctor was very close to the word used to embed man, and similarly for nurse and woman, but not the other way around. In other words, there was in some sense a kind of gender bias in the embedding itself, coming from the corpus. And that gender bias was being encoded in the way the words were being represented. <coughs> These are the two papers, and again, they're very nice piece of work. They both came to the same conclusion using different kinds of word embeddings. This seems like a general problem. Now, you can ask yourself, well, so what? <laughs> and that's a tricky thing here. So what is a good question. One paper, paper number one, came to this conclusion and said, this is a problem. This is a problem because you have a biased representation and we need to de-bias it. So what they said was, okay, I have these words that are associated with the gender axis, but these words themselves have no intrinsic gender structure or should not have any intrinsic gender structure to them. So let's collapse along this dimension to remove that gender component. And then, then do our training on that reduced representation. So in other words, they're trying to remove bias from the representation itself. The other paper, the second one, said, no, 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 no. This bias is a natural bias coming from the corpus. It indeed a bias, and the good thing about the algorithm was that it sort of revealed that bias to us in this, in this geometric way. We should be aware of this, but we should remove it. Because it's just bias appearing in the data itself. That's not something we want to get rid of. And I think this brings up, so this brings up a more general question, right? If we see skew in this data used to build a model, what should we do? Is it an artifact of the collection process, or is it something that we should remove because it's just an artifact? Does it reflect true differences in skill levels, even if it's not sort of politically correct to say so, and should we keep it? Or does it reflect true differences in skill level, but because of individuals living in an unequal society, and therefore what should we do? This is not an easy question to answer. And it turns out that you can't answer this question purely technically. It turns out to relate very strongly to your own beliefs and biases about how societies form. Which brings me to the other piece of work that we've been trying to do now, is essentially to axiomatize fairness. So what does this mean? Most thinking about how we do machine learning imagines we have some kind of feature space, we build a model, and we get into a decision space. What I'm arguing here is that what we think of as the feature space is really a set of features we want to use and a set of features we end up using. And the way we go from the features we want to use to the features we end up using involves some kind of transformation which is mediated by beliefs we have about the world. If we see in our data a skew in sort of, you know, 100 meter sprint times between two groups of people, we can either believe that this is a true representation of the natural skill, or we might believe that, no, because of, you know, environmental factors and socioeconomic status, this group is showing different numbers but it's not intrinsically true that, that they actually have slower time to That they might actually be better, but because of other reasons unrelated to their intrinsic skill. Now, I'm not telling you which way to believe. The point is that belief is required to understand what this data is telling you. It also is required to understand how to define fairness. If you believe what you're observing is in fact the truth, then something like individual fairness makes a lot of sense. You have accurate observations of people's skills. You should definitely treat them similarly. If you believe that there is a, a structural bias in how certain groups are being treated, then you need a different notion of fairness to compensate for that. But you can't come up with a notion before you know what you're thinking about. So the mathematical question here is really about, can we formalize these notions of distance <coughs> and spaces? More, more technically, can we think of the whole process of defining fairness and defining transformation as, as basically mappings between spaces, quantify the degree of distortion of those mappings, and use that to define fairness? This is still sort of work in progress. It's not as precise as some of the other things I'm talking about. Um, uh, this is basically the direction that we are going in that we feel we need to look at. Okay. 
A specific example of this is what, we, what uh, Kate Crawford in our very nice new scheme of called harms of representation. Think of stereotyping. Stereotyping is a process by which we ascribe to members of a group <coughs> characteristics of one particular member of the group. And they may not be the average member of the group, it could be an outlier. Right, so it's specifically, if there's a group of people we don't like, we tend to ascribe to all of those people aspects of the person we like. <coughs> sort of a natural human sort of thing. And if we like a group of people, we ascribe to them the aspects of the most positive sort of example of the group. So stereotyping is a reduction of a group to an individual. It's a transformation in the sense I was describing. Can we quantify this transformation? Assuming this transformation occurs, can we correct for it in our learning algorithms? And how do we form it? That's another sort of direction. Another example of an expanded context, again linked to data, is, is this problem of feedback loops. So what is the problem of feedback loops? It's the problem that when you make decisions about individuals, again, data are people, those decisions and those people might go back and feed back into your model again. <coughs> right. And I think there's no better example of this than the realm of what is called predictive policing. So what's predictive policing? This is one version of it. Given historical data about crime in different neighborhoods, you want to build a model to predict crime and use this to effectively allocate officers to areas. If you believe that based on historical data, this area is going to be high crime tomorrow and this is not, you want to send more officers there and less officers here. So these are some of the companies that are involved with um, building tools of this kind. And again, this, I, this article came out three days ago. Um, the LAPD has a new, so LAPD was involved with some of these tools, but they also have a new surveillance formula or by Palantir, which is not which is not place based, <coughs> but it's person based. And I can tell you more about this later. It's 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 horrifying uh, exactly what they're doing. It's very scary. <laughs> but uh, but uh, with, uh, let me get back to the space based model. So there's a very nice piece of work that came out in 2016 by Christian Lum and William Isaac from the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. They were trying to understand this feedback loop problem and predictive policing, especially using a tool called Predpool, one of the companies that's out there. And here's what they wanted to understand. Suppose you have a pattern, they're looking at Oakland. Suppose you have a pattern of crime, and what they were doing is they're looking at drug use crime. So they had national statistics on drug use, and this is kind of a heat map of the intensity of drug use across an area. And they want to know what would happen if you send police to neighborhoods, or a simulation of police to neighborhoods based on this, and they discovered crime, went back and reported what crime they discovered, and then the model kind of iterated over it. And what they were able to show, then you start seeing a concentration. And this is sort of intuitively reasonable that you might say the model essentially gets more feedback from certain areas and might decide to double down those areas. And unfortunately, in this case, these also correlate with high minority uh, population neighborhoods as well, which is part of the point of what we're doing. So we looked at their empirical study and we said, okay, is there a way to formalize this, to, map, to sort of formalize mathematically what's going on and therefore be able to provide maybe interventions to fix some of these problems? And to do that, of course, you have to build a model, you have to make some assumptions. So here's a simple ex assumption. Um, officers toss coins based on the current prediction of the model, decide where to go next. Right? The only re information retained about a crime is a count. This seems ludicrously simplified, but this is in fact what Red Bull does. If you look at sort of public literature on what this uh, system does, it does not look at demographic information, other things that could be viewed as problematic. And if officers just go to the area, this is a truth in advertising sort of constraint, if they go to an area with some baseline crime rate, they will actually see crime at that rate. And what you want as a goal, roughly speaking, is that if you have different crime rates in different areas, you want the police to be allocated appropriately. Right. So it turns out that earned models are a very effective way to model this problem. So for those of you who've done some machine learning and know about poly earns, poly earns is a special case of a general earned model, which looks like this. I have an earned which has balls of different colors. I have a table of rules that says if I sample a ball, this is how I replace things. I always put the ball back that I pulled out, but I might put it back extra ones based on the table. So you sample a ball at random from the urn. And you say, oh, it's this color. I look at this table, it says, okay, I should replace one of this and zero of that. So you add that back in and you also put in one more. And you do this again and again and again. And with urn models, the most basic question is, in the limit, what is the problem limiting fraction of this color? Okay. So what does this have to do with policing? Well, not very much, so I model it. And here's the model. Assume you have only two neighborhoods. Each one is one color. Visiting a neighborhood corresponds to sampling a ball that color. This is our assumption in one. Observing a crime corresponds to adding a new ball that color because that's new data you add to your system. So now that I have that, I can say, good, can I use the theory of earned models to understand how this process is going to evolve? And um, so the simple earned, you have uniform crime rates, both regions the same crime rate, and now you can say, what is the convergent behavior of this earned? 
So I'd like to, so at this point, I'd like to stop and do a quick poll of the audience just to see what people think. What, so in other words, think of this. So the two years, the same crime rate. So if I pull out a ball of cell, I'm going to replace it again with that and this with that. Say I start off with, you know, um, one ball of each color. What do you think the limiting probability of, say, this color is going to be? If you know the answer, don't, don't, don't. Point five. Sorry? Half? I mean, half. Years. Okay. I, I call this the, co the, the Colbert probability formula, right? Either, either something happens or it won't happen, so it's always probably half. <laughs> <laughs> Point six one eight oh three three nine eight. <laughs> you golden ratio on this yeah. one, perhaps? Okay, golden ratio minus one. That's, that's a good one. I've never heard that one before. Okay. okay, we have half and we have golden ratio minus one. Depends on which ball gets drawn first. That's not an answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, either, either one or zero. So either one or zero. Okay, good. I, I can take that. Yeah, either one or zero. So I'll take one more vote before I go on. One minus one over eight. One minus one over eight. You just want to sort of get more funky with the terminology. Okay, well, I'm happy now, so you're all wrong. And this is sort of basic poly Ern theory. If the Ern starts with some number, let's say one and one, then the probability of, the limiting probability is not a single number. It's actually a, a draw from a random from a distribution, a beta distribution. So in other words, the answer could be anything. All it depends on is the shape of the initial numbers of things. In other words, think about what this means for this as a Poisson model. What it's saying is that if I run this process, the convergent behavior of my model as a representation of my belief of where crime is has nothing to do with the crime rate. All it depends on is my initial configuration. Well, that kind of sucks. <laughs> but it's chaotic. It's right. It's not fractal, it's just that it, it, it well, and, and it's not fractal. The beta distribution is very well defined distribution. Basically, if this is, think of this as, if this is one, one, then it's a uniform draw over the entire interval. Okay. So it's like a random coin box, basically. Or it's a, it's a, it's a random coin with a, a particular bias. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I, I guess what Oliver said was right in the sense that the initial set of things I draw is what dictates that. No, no, the initial number of things in the bin, not what I draw. One way I think about this is that, you know, maybe the first thing I pick is the light color. Sure. It kind of slowly tips me in that direction, but it doesn't tip me enough. Two to one is not enough of a ratio to sort of completely overwhelm the possibility of going back. And so you just kind of basically oh, go all the place. The more skewed the initial bias is, the more skewed the answer will be. But again, it depends only on the initial setting. <coughs> I see. Not on what the actual crime rate is telling you. You can do this with, uh, now that we have this machinery at our disposal, we can change these numbers. You can have different parameters in different neighborhoods, and then what's going to happen? There's a beautiful result that is in a survey by Renlund. Beautiful, this is amazing. It says that for any values of ABCD, you write in a particular quadratic equation, and one root of that is your answer. This is so cool. <laughs> and then you can apply it. Is it not cool? It's just, it's just amazing that they were able to show that. So. Um, and then, but if you apply that to that matrix where you have two different rates, it turns out that you get something like this, where if the rates are even slightly different, the model will just drive towards whichever one is more. It'll converge to one, basically. So this is the, again, driving to one or zero, but there's a slight difference between them. So it's very sensitive to this effect. And you can actually see this in simulation. So we simulated, essentially, Fred Paul, or at least what they said <coughs> was a version of it. So this is very noisy, so let me just walk through it slowly. This red line is your target rate of what you would expect, like a 0 0.6, 0 0.4 kind of split. What you see here are time epochs over time uh, simulations. And these black dots uh, are examples of what you actually get with one run. So what you see here with this heavy black here is that there's a slight offset, but the system essentially is very noisily driving towards one. And you can see this effect in, in sort of another way here, that over time it sort of drives towards one. Again, it's all very noisy, but it's also part of the problem. These things are noisy. And what this, the, the validation of the earned model results against the actual system tells you is that essentially you are, you are taking your model predictions too seriously. That if you have, if you believe that there's a very high crime rate in the area and you go there and you see crime, that should not be an independent update of your model. That's what your model is telling you. And so I'm saying this informally, but this is formally saying this. And so you kind of only want to take the observations seriously if it in some sense goes against what your model is telling you. 
If it's consistent with your model, you should not take it that seriously. And of course, you already have the model, so you know what the model expects you to see in any area. So again, there's a formal way of seeing much of what I just said. It's sort of, you can think of it as a rejection sampling variant of, of a Horvitz-Thompson estimator, where you basically don't take all the observations seriously. You throw some of them out, okay, if you think that they're the redundant. And then, and again, this is a very noisy chart. All I'll ask you to look at is look at, say, this versus that. It's again very noisy, but what you see is that instead of having this, this random accumulation of things drifting towards the top, you see a slow convergence, again, very noisily, towards where you want it to be. So the intervention kind of works. But you can do more. So this is sort of a black box solution where I said, okay, I have this procedure that's doing something. I'm going to change the way I feed inputs into the model so it doesn't learn the wrong thing. But I could try to build this from scratch. And I think the principle here that we've been trying to argue is that people have been thinking about decision making as a machine learning problem. You collect train data, you build a model, and you evaluate. And we're arguing that for these kinds of problems, you should think of it as a reinforcement learning problem where your, your model is constantly updating, and you have to recognize the fact that it's updating and sending you off in different directions and adjust for it accordingly. And the key problem, of course, in this area is that if you don't send an office or a neighborhood, you don't get feedback on what happens. People might call 911, they might not. In fact, our technical model accounts for the fact that sometimes you get people to call 911, so I won't get to that here. But this is an example of limited feedback, where sometimes you do something, you don't know what happens as a result of it. And there's a formal framework for looking at this in machine learning. It's called partial monitoring. You have actions, you have outcomes, you have a loss matrix and a feedback matrix. What you want to do is minimize your overall loss, but all you're told is the feedback. So you do some action, there's some secret outcome that happens, and you're given a feedback entry. What you want to give is a loss entry, but you still want to minimize the loss. And of course, this seems impossible, but you have to, but the results you can prove depend on the relationship between the loss and the feedback matrix. If there's some positive relation between them, you can do that. And what does it mean to minimize loss? Well, you want to minimize regret, which is, again, a standard notion in online learning of the best of the best single action versus what you actually ended up paying. And there's a beautiful sort of four-way dichotomy theorem by Bartok et al. that says that depending on the relationship between your loss matrix and your feedback matrix, you'll get one of these forms of regret. So again, if you're not familiar with machine learning, this is good, this is pretty good, this is just weird, and this is hopeless. I think that's technically what they're called. Good, good, weird, good. So I think this is trivial. A trivial, good, weird, and hopeless. Yeah. So, um, which is nice because now that means you can categorize your problem by saying, okay, if I can satisfy, I can determine which of those four complicated conditions between L and H my problem satisfies, I can invoke the theorem and get a bound of this kind. Again, how does this apply to predictive policing? You have K officers and regions. Your action is an assignment of officers to regions. Your outcome is the actual crime. And just for Technicality, you assume one person, one officer detects one crime, so you can actually calculate loss function. So your loss is basically this function here, the, diff, the sum of the max of OI minus AIM0. So this will be a number of crimes, number of officers, and if you have more officers than crime, you won't get any loss function. Otherwise, you think. And this is the feedback matrix, which is the min of the two things. Again, you think about this exactly what will happen. This is a partial modeling problem because these two things are not the same. And so, with a bit of work, it's not too hard to show that you can get a two-thirds grid on the kind of weird bond I mentioned earlier. But you can do a bit better by examining these loss functions very carefully. Again, it's um, uh, basically, rather than looking at the amount of crime you miss, you look at the number of officers who failed to catch any crime. And you can show that the regret you get from these things differ by a constant, which means that the optimal solution is the same. Uh, optimal strategy is the same. But this, if you call your officers back and say, well, did you catch any crime or not, is observable. So this becomes what is called a bandit problem, or technically a semi-bandit problem, and you can get a solution to this So let's uh, get back to our views of context. Right? So we've talked about how, as you go further and further, you get different questions you want to ask. And um, what I want to talk about towards the end of this talk is sort of the last sort of realm of context, which is where you are thinking much more broadly about how your work affects society. And to me, a lot of this is about education. Education for whom? Well, it's education primarily for data scientists, because those are the people I teach, for policymakers and the lay public. Some of the things I've, I've taught, various classes on this, I've taught, uh, I taught a short course on fairness, accountability, and transparency. I taught, um, um, what happened here? Oh, something weird happened here. Okay. This. Okay, this is a, 
this is my way. This is the way one with those animations. Okay, fine. So I taught a class. Uh, so the, what I want to say is that most recently I taught the class in ethics and data science. This was in last uh, fall. Maybe I can get the blurb. Yeah. So this is the blurb for the class. And I think in the process of teaching the students, so most students coming to this class are data scientists who are kind of curious about what does this do in ethics class. And the general reaction to being asked to think about the ethics of what they do is say, look, hey, I'm just a data scientist. Don't ask me to think about the larger ramifications of what I'm doing. But it turned out that through the course of the class, trying to get them to think through the details of what they were doing and how it affects people at large, certain very interesting things came up. So first of all, the way we think about data and the way we think about how we interact with data depends a lot on the metaphor we choose to use to talk about it. So in the business world, it was very popular for a long time to say, data is oil. We will mine it and we will get money from it. We'll just dig it up wherever we can. And in some sense, this is how tech companies operate. They think of data as just thing lying around waiting to be dug up and monetized. Another view, of course, is data as private property. And that's where all the conflicts between Facebook and individuals come in like this. This is my data. How dare you take my data and monetize it as your oil? And a lot of the tensions and the ethical conflicts come between people arguing for one view of data versus a different view of data. So the tech companies say, you know, what is your problem? We just got this data, you know, what is, how can you argue? They are thinking of data in a very different way to make this up. And to think ethically about the way you use data, you have to understand these different perspectives. So another perspective, for example, is data as a common good. So if you collect DNA sequences from people to put into this uh, database of a million uh, genomes to sort of help people search rare disease. So I put my genome in. What about my identical twin? I don't want identical. But what about my identical twin if I had one? And suppose they didn't consent to have their DNA put in. Suppose my sister didn't consent to have her DNA put in. Well, it was kind of half there already because mine is there. Right? The, the golden thing, state killer who was caught recently was caught by DNA use from all these public databases. I mean, I'm sure everyone's happy that the killer was caught, but there are other issues associated with the ethics of collecting genome data in this manner, which is being repurposed in this way. Um, as people have talked about data as a hazardous waste, especially after the Equifax scandal. If you want to collect data and you don't treat it carefully, you don't put safeguards around it, then you should be punished when people can hack it, and so on. So this idea of thinking about the metaphors for the ways we use data is very important to think about the ethics surrounding the use of data. Another more depressing thing was that there are many, many parallels, imperfect and otherwise, with how science has been abused in the industry, and the students know nothing about it. Uh, I mentioned the Nuremberg, Nuremberg trials, and people said, what's a Nuremberg trials? So, you know, and the, the sad thing is, you know, the early work in criminology, so the scientific use of criminology goes back to Cesare Lombroso in the 1800s, um, who came up with sort of brilliant observations like, you know, if your earlobe is very long, you might be a pedophile, things like that, based on sort of a scientific examination of the data at hand. Um, and in fact, there are unironic articles right now talking about machine learning as a new Lombrosian paradigm without realizing that this may not be a compliment. <laughs> um, there are people, like I said, people didn't know about phrenology. I don't know how many, how many of you know about phrenology? Some of you. So the idea is that, uh, so, the, so the idea is that, you know, different parts of your brain represent different parts of your personality. Not entirely wrong. And therefore, more of that personality means there's more brain there. <laughs> you, you're laughing, but okay. But, but, and so you press the bumps on your head, you will get to know what someone's personality is like. <laughs> Again, Kathy O'Neill called machine learning the new computational phrenology. So that's kind of the level of discussion we're at. And of course, phrenology led to eugenics, and I don't need to tell people about the, sort of the horrors wrought by eugenics. The fact that we have IRBs comes from the Nuremberg trials, it comes from the Tuskegee experiments, the syphilis, the, these horrible syphilis experiments that were done. These are all things that I think data scientists need to know today because these are very, very similar to the kinds of experiments people run today without realizing that there are lessons to be learned from those things. And I think that's a very important aspect of what I do when I teach uh, a class like this. Uh, one last thing that I want to mention as far as sort of, is that we don't often spend enough time thinking about the features we use in our data. So I talked about this issue of representation bias, but even something as simple as the use of race. Right? So race is one of these very complicated features that is predictive of how people are being treated but it's not necessarily scientifically predictive of how people's intrinsic sort of abilities are. And it's a very controversial topic. I'm not going to try and make so sort of strong claims here. But there is you know, much less scientific evidence than people think there is for the connection between race and genetics and other things like that, especially if you look at the history of how race was, was sort of constructed, essentially, as a social construct in society. And so being aware of these things, that features you may be using or think you may be using as reliable features to predict behavior might have nothing to do with behavior after all. 
It's something that, again, data scientists don't think much about and we need to think more about in this class. And that's what I try to do in this class. So last thing, uh, talk about, I do a bit of, I do a fair amount of outreach work. I think this is also sort of a fun thing to do. Um, I'm on the board of the, of the ACLU in Utah and I've also worked with the ACLU in Pennsylvania and New York. Um, this is sort of, and, and the Utah Sentencing Commission as well as the, the New York City uh, has this sort of various risk assessment tools that they use. This one called failure to appear is to basically predict whether people who show for bail hearings or not. And um, it's in, there's a research advisory council that's helping them decide how to build this tool correctly to make sure there are no hidden biases in the way they're doing it. And so these are some of the things where you know we're trying to sort of take the academic work we're doing and push it out to the community so that people can actually be sort of have benefit hopefully from some of the research that's going on here. Um, we have a new conference on this topic. There's a whole community that's grown up around this. That it happened for the first time this year after many workshops. We had 500 people at the venue and 400 more on the waiting list because you couldn't fit them all in. And um, it's, a, it's an interesting area to be in. It's, it's truly interdisciplinary. I mean, these are just some of the areas that sort of intersect people I talk with on a regular basis. From both CS, law, economics, sociology, political science, and medical learning, how to sort of understand people's different concerns about these topics. And uh, with that, I think I will uh, conclude. I just thank you for listening and for your patience. And that's a good time. Thank you. Yeah. It's going to be more philosophical. So, uh, if, so initially you uh, described the whole analysis as this bar, black box, and then sort of expanding things. If I replace this box by a human being, yeah. they've been doing this for a long time. Yes, we right? have. So a lot of, we have. Uh, and uh, so a lot of, if you look at it from that context, a lot of what you mentioned is not quite as scary. I mean, right. yes, no, well, there's something automated, but it'd be nice to characterize how that compares to a human being. Yes. But, but also, if you go back and look at how we've dealt with this, it's not technical like how you mentioned no. it. Because our notions of fairness, auditing, and, and so on, have evolved through what was considered the norm 200 years ago is definitely not what it is now. Right. So uh, I guess your thoughts on trying to define this in a more technical way and giving it exact numbers and being able to mention that without an understanding of how our own notions of these things evolve. So it's a very, very good question. Um, another way of putting this is that, you know, why are we expecting albums to do what good people can't do, right? Okay. And I think one answer to your question is that the norms and the structures, the accountability, notions of accountability, notions of law, notions of social ethics, have, as you say, evolved over centuries to, to understand how human decision making works. We've had jurisprudence, and you know, we've had ways of dealing with them. We've had, as you said, these things have changed over time. We don't have any of those structures with algorithms at all. We have no notion of accountability. We have no way of sort of punishing an algorithm for a bad decision, the way we can punish a human for a bad decision. Right? The judges can be impeached. A bad decision maker with the law can be punished for a sort of liability. That's malpractice. That's you know, a doctor that does a bad surgery and does an approval way can, be, you know, can lose a license. A lawyer can be disbarred. These are processes that we put into place over decades to sort of, or longer even, to figure out how to achieve accountability and achieve some modicum of responsibility. If we're now trying to take all that out and put something else in, for which none of these structures apply, we're going to have a problem. And so you can think of some of this work that we're doing. You're saying, to what extent can we recreate or create structures <coughs> that create the same sort of social glue, if you wish, or the social grease to make this processing work the way we've understood the work for so long for humans? So some of it is trying to see, can we parallel it? Some of it is, okay, the parallel is not appropriate. What else can we do in its place? And that's where we're trying to bring these technical tools. I know that answers your question, but. But it's a valid point that, you know, we, we don't, I, I think for me, the scary thing is we're jettisoning what we understand about human decision making without understanding what we're putting in place of it. And that's a problem. Not that it's bad, but that we should understand what the consequences are. The only reaction I have is, uh, yes, I, somebody has to take a first step, and I think, I guess, for particular domains, there are tech, there are definitions of these things. Uh, but uh, from everything you mentioned, there is no evolution over time. Like, it's not clear that some of these things change or... Uh, you mean the technical stuff? Right. Well, it's only been a few years. Right, right, right. So I think this is a... So for example... No, but in the formulation, right? So you, you, you'll need to say if this has to stick, I, I want some definition of how right. I judge bias, then... I think some of that is happening. It's not as easy for me to articulate formally. But I think some sense in which, again, we're trying to go away from the one true definition. 
and try to argue for what is the right way to present information to the decision makers, augmented by an automatic procedure that allows them to come to some reasonable conclusion. So it's in the works, is what I'll say. Yeah, we don't have clear answers. Though. That was a great talk. Thank you. Um, how, did, did, I don't know if you ever saw the video of like an uh, experimenter feeding like a grape and a grape and a slice of cucumber or celery to the, 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 the monkey. Yes, and the monkey is like totally flipping yeah. out because one gets good food and one gets bad food. Yes, it's unfair. Yes, like, and how, children will lose as well. Yeah, so they like, might be quite even how, how do these like you talk about all these different notions of fairness? Yes. some of it seem like pretty built into all kinds of social animals and not just oh, very animals. much like individual fairness. I'm a monkey, he's a monkey, why the heck did we get the grape and I got this lousy cucumber? Yeah. So, like, is there is there a notion of, like, sort of, like, just, like, so, like, conflicting notions of fairness? You're saying you can't achieve sort of group fairness and individual fairness, and it seems like some of these, like, a lot of these seem like continuity conditions where maybe we just don't like discontinuity. Um, right, so, okay, so, two parts. So, yes, you can prove, and I mentioned this, there's been some nice work by folks that have shown that for example, trying to achieve fairness by treating groups equally and trying to achieve fairness by distributing errors equally are in incompatible with each other. You cannot do this except in trivial settings. It's also not hard to construct examples where trying to be fair by treating individuals similarly and treating groups same also cannot be done in simultaneously. You're also correct that, that there are many, many different notions of what people perceive as fairness. For example, there's something called procedural fairness where the fairness is in the process used to reach an outcome, even if the outcome seems different for two different individuals, as long as the process looks fair, we are content that, the process, that, that there is this notion of fairness. There is a subtle difference between fairness and justice that philosophers have talked about that I didn't want to get into here, that sometimes when we say something is fair, what we mean is something should be just, right? You know, it's fair, for example, how many of you have seen the new Avengers movie? How many of you want to see the new Avengers movie? Darn it, I was gonna, Give an example from the new Avengers movie. No, I can't. So well, you can, I'll forget. <laughs> well, there's more than one of you, so I don't want to spoil it. But anyway, there is a sense, the sense in which a procedure could be fair, right? But it may not be just by any means. In, you know, an eye for an eye and cutting off a hand, if it's consistently applied to everyone who steals, it's fair, but not just in some other sense. So there's, you're right that there are many different notions of fairness that we're struggling with to get it out in, the, in this area. Here. And some of them are incompatible, some are just different pieces altogether. And, it's, again, ongoing process. <laughs> and then, uh, sort of one, one more quick practical question. Yeah. So you work with data scientists in sort of thinking about ethics. Yeah. And uh, do you have sort of a practical guide for like people graduating and working at startups? Like, if they're making a product that is horribly biased in some way, mm -hmm. but less biased than the first biased than people, sort of how do you navigate that space as like uh, just a just a data scientist working for a company? Well, I think these things are never binary. I think if you're worried that there is a bias in the process you're using, the first thing you do is say, okay, where is the bias potentially coming from? Is there a reason that certain features are causing problems? Can I throw them out and still get equal effectiveness? If I can't get equal effectiveness, why not? Have I collected the data in a way that might allow me to mitigate some of these issues? So I think there are many steps you can take to question the data collection, data processing process pipeline as a whole to still achieve the goal you want, because your boss is telling you to build something, you can't say I won't do it. But you can try to mitigate some of these by being aware of how the way you collect data, the way you represent data, the way you build your classifier, the way you choose your cost function could affect the outcome. And that's what I would say to some to a data scientist. And I've said this to students who have asked me this exact question that I'm not asking you to all get up and protest and say I'm not going to do this. It's more like there are better there are if you think a little bit, there are often much better ways of collecting data and building your models and to pay attention to issues of bias that you might be concerned about. Why not just do it? Oh, yeah, sorry. So, um, I'm the lawyer in the room. Ah, Apologies. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm glad, glad you didn't heckle me when I said all kinds of horrifying things. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, the economist would get up and heckle me immediately. So, yeah. No, no, this, this is extremely illuminating. Um, and, and uh, you know, I guess, you know, so, so it's, it seems like there's, been a, there's a lot of work, a lot of really valuable work thinking about how to screen out prohibited sort of reasoning or prohibited reasons from in, in the algorithmic decision making. But there's lots of contexts where um, we don't, we're not just concerned that there aren't impermissible you know, reasons, but we want to know what the reasons are. Yes. <laughs> right? Right. right, that the fairness of a decision sort of depends Correct. on some kind of explanation Correct. that um, is, is 
Because I said that GDPR that, that can be reviewed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so and I and I wonder, um, you know, and, and that seems like a difficult problem if you're uh, with various kinds of you know, machine learning algorithms, which, yes. are, which are sort of difficult to understand. So. Um, from your perspective, is there, so I guess two questions. Is that, is that sort of notion of explainability something that we're going to have to learn to live without in order to you know, embrace this new technology? Or is there some you know, prospect of, uh, uh, of replacing sort of? Great, great question. So first of all, in your, if you're in Europe, the answer is no, you can't afford to live without it because GDPR is not required. For those of you who don't know, the General Data Protection Regulation, which is coming to effect on May 25th, is a new EU-wide guideline saying Again, roughly speaking, there's discussion of what this actually means. Roughly speaking, any decision taken by algorithm on, on about you, you have a right to demand an explanation for. What this means, no one knows. There's a lot of companies making a lot of money claiming to know what this means and offering consulting services. No one's offering me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but so I think explainability is something that will be forced on people, at least in Europe. And I suspect some of that will leach over to the US at the very least, but we'll see. I think it is absolutely imperative that we demand I think it's a cop out to say that we can't. I think we can. And I think we sh I would be willing to go as far as to say if your tool cannot provide explainability, you shouldn't be using it. So I think it's important to understand what the system is actually doing. It. And again, this may not be true in all contexts, but in certain contexts, and, and with things like Fikra, right? We already have guidelines saying that if you get a den if you get denied credit, they have to provide some form of explanation as to why or what aspects of your of your portfolio were deficient in some ways to cause this. And if you can prove that that was an, an error, they have to rerun the process again. Right. So it's not like we don't have a precedent in the disparate impact discussions. The, the finding of disparate impact is the first step in the process. And the business can afford can go back and say there's, there's, a, there's sort of a reasonable cause for why they have to do it the way they did, and they won't be culpable. So I think there is the basis for doing this, and I think we can expect more, and we should. And there's actually a body of research and explainability going on right now. I don't work in it myself, but there's a lot of people thinking about this, and again, the human-computer interaction aspects of how you present explanations that are convincing to people. And this, is, and this is what I was thinking about when you're talking about explainability, right? Yes, exactly. With the fraud cases. So. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think you know, in the machine learning, there's an acceptance that there's a, a conflict between interpretability and accuracy down, back to random forest and other yeah. de decision trees yeah. um, and I, I don't know somebody commented that um, I don't think it was the Leo Brennan's article the uh, tale of two cultures but they, they run something through a complicated process like a deep neural network and then they fit a decision tree to yep. at the end to explain it yep. to people. Yep. But that's really not necessarily what went in, um, went well, on. It's, you get a happy feeling that you think, you know, well, it'll work, but right. it's not really what happened in the you know, so. Right, and I, I think that's the problem. So for example, um, uh, so Cynthia Rudin, uh, well, I think visited yep. here a couple of years ago. She, she was here as a distinguished speaker a year ago and was my undergraduate student. There you go. And so she's been doing some work on basically arguing that for things like recidivism prediction, you can either use this cryptic proprietary black box called Compass, which has 137 features, uh -huh. or you can retrain the data on her model, which has four features, and tells you exactly how much contribution each feature provides in an additive right. model to the final outcome. And if you and so I think this argument about interpretability versus accuracy is a bit of a red herring. I don't think we fully explore the space of what's possible. There are people, for example, Rich Cardone at Microsoft has been pushing these models called additive models, where you have additive nonlinear sort of components, and you can generate fair, pretty accurate results compared to say deep learning, but you still have a much more interpretability than you would normally. I think interpretability, like privacy and like fairness, is in the eyes of the beholder. Who's interpreting? Who's the person asking? I think the answer is different if it's the judge asking, or the defendant, or the prosecutor, or someone else. And we have to think through that more. I think. Mm -hmm. the, I know my answer to all this is like ongoing work and more research needed, but that's actually true in this case. We don't have clean answers to this question. Yeah. There's nobody else I'll go again. Uh, so well, he's the, a timekeeper, so you can uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, the, so uh, going back to the discussion of comparing humans and what algorithms do, uh, it, it, so a couple of times you've addressed this, this notion of fairness and so on. There are several notions that are conflicting. And usability, HCI is another field where it's, it's the, the interpretation is somewhat subjective. Yeah. And usually what they do is sort of human trials, right? Yeah. So you, you run through a bunch of people and then decide. Yeah. So are, are there studies to judge some of the algorithmic effects and see if the 
they're fair, so, they're audible, like all these questions. There, there has been some work on how individuals perceive fairness. There's in fact been work by Krishna Gumari at MPI in, in, in Sarbrooklyn, sort of looking at can we use crowdsourced interpretations of what people consider to be reasonable attributes to use for decision making to build a decision making process that those people would consider fair. So there's been some work. I think there's probably, so again, as a computer scientist who's come to this relatively recently, I suspect there's a lot more work out there that I'm not familiar with. For example, in organizational psychology, um, organizations look at you know, how do you evaluate people in an organization, and what do they consider to be perceived as a fair process for evaluation. So there's a lot of literature there on what people will perceive as being fair. Procedural fairness is one example of a fairness of a process where if the process is view is evaluated fairly for everyone or consistently for everyone, people will view that as a fair process, even if they don't like the outcome. In other words, you know, I, I, I had my shot, I got my grades, I failed the class, I'm annoyed that I failed the class, but I'm not going to feel that it's unfair. As long as I see everyone having done the same exam and having graded exactly the same way. A lot of this thing with the monkey examples is a question of procedural fairness, right, the outrage board being treated differently in some ways. So there are, is a lot of work on this. And I think I personally feel like, you know, based on what you're saying, I think I should tap into more of that. I don't think I, I fully understand myself how people perceive fairness in different contexts. I know that there's work on this that would be worth exploring. Yeah. Oh, in the interest of time, let's thank Suresh. Uh, he'll hang around for like 15 odd minutes if you want to come up and talk. Yeah. You should say you also hire on tomorrow, right?